When I was three, my parents made the mistake of teaching me to ski. I really, really liked pointing my skis straight downhill and going fast. And as I got older, I wanted to ski faster, jump higher, and go down more difficult and steeper runs. I wanted to be best. Now, this quest for best is not unique to me or to skiing. In sports, in academics, politics, and other areas, we obsess over who is fastest, gets the highest grade, receives the most votes, or has the largest number of followers on Twitter. Obsessing over best has even come to define our winner-takes-all society, where there is one best winner and the rest of us. Will this singular focus on bests allow us to survive more challenging problems like preventing pollution or supplying water to the world's seven-plus billion people? Unfortunately, the answer is often no. So today, I will show a preferred survival strategy to best, which is near best, and how, with near best, we can both survive and thrive. But before I show you how near best works and why it's preferable, I want to first explain how engineers identify best and optimal solutions to problems and why these optimal solutions are often deeply unsatisfying. I say deeply unsatisfying both as someone who grew up wanting to ski all the time and is now an engineer, <laughs> and an engineer who likes working on but rarely finds the optimal solutions to problems like find the low-cost way a city can supply water to its residents. Yes, most people, including me, don't have a good idea of how to do this. There are three things that we need to do to solve for best. First, we have to articulate a quantifiable and observable measure of best to reach our goal. This is the instrument that we're going to hold up to each candidate solution and quantify how each solution performs. We use this measure to distinguish the best solution from the rest. For example, city water managers, this measure could be the dollars that they have to spend on their water management actions. The best solution has the lowest cost. For ski racers who are standing at the top of a mountain, this measure of best is the time to complete the run. Here again, the shortest or fastest time indicates best. Second, we have to list all the candidate solutions or options that can reach the goal. For skiers, this is the multiple routes down the mountain and how many turns they're going to make along the way. For city water managers, it's the options of whether they're going to drill a new well or expand the capacity of a pipe or promote water conservation or some combination of the above. Third, we have to constrain and limit the options to only allow feasible ones. We're only going to allow ski routes that start at the top of the mountain and finish at the bottom. We're going to require water management actions to meet the needs of the city residents. This graph now shows how we can combine the limits, the available strategies, and the measure of best to identify the best solution. The vertical axis plots the measure of best, which for a skier standing at the top of the mountain is the time to get to the bottom to complete the run. We want to minimize this time. The horizontal axis shows all the candidate solutions, the allowable ski routes down the mountain. And the blue curve shows the time to ski down each route. The best route minimizes this time. It's the low point on the blue curve, shown by the purple dot. For simple problems, we can use a graph to find the optimal solution. For more complex problems, we program a computer. The beauty of BEST is that it weeds out complexity to identify the single best and optimal solution, shown by the single purple dot. But this best and optimal solution can often also be deeply unsatisfying, because 
best is not reachable for all of us. We all can't be Olympic gold medal winners. Best can also be unsatisfying if the measure that we're using, like time for a skier, doesn't reflect our actual goal. I love these three elegant ski tracks because they illustrate both of these deeply unsatisfying aspects of best really well. My friends Eric Seierstad and Jim Rogers and I made the tracks two years ago. It snowed the night before, we climbed up to the top and debated for a bit about how to ski down through the upper rocks and trees. Finally, Eric went first. He pointed his skis straight down between the rocks on the left side of the photo, and once he was clear of them, he made a few fast turns that are the single track that you see on the left. He was at the bottom in under a minute. Jim went next. He headed in the opposite direction for still untracked powder on the right side of the photo. And below the rocks, he linked numerous more turns to prolong the bliss that you feel when you float through some of the world-class, fresh, light, deep powder that we get here in Utah. Finally, it was my turn. And to be honest, Eric's route actually scared me. <laughs> I just could not see myself pointing, down, pointing my skis down through the rocks or controlling the insane speed that I gained below. So I followed Jim's descent route down the right side of the photo. And below the rocks, I used his tracks as a blueprint to carve numerous identical turns next to and neatly inside his to ski at the same pace to likewise prolong the bliss of skiing fresh powder. Now, for those of you who aren't skiers, skiing next to and making your tracks neatly inside an existing track is called spooning. And I mention spooning because if you think engineers are only cold, calculating, straight-minded optimizers, <laughs> well, we're not. <laughs> we can also be cuddly and even personable. <laughs> and while these two things may take a little bit more time, they're often the key to solving difficult problems like surviving skiing down a steep ski slope. Taking a little bit more time than the time taken by the best single optimal solution is also an example of near best. And more generally, near best is all the candidate solutions that perform by our measure close to the best solution. Returning to the graph, again, the purple dot shows the single best ski route. It's the one with the fastest time, and, is, and that time is shown by the dotted purple line. Now, near bent best lengthens this time by a specified amount, as shown by the rising orange line. We allow longer times than the optimal time. And the benefit of this is that the orange line now intersects the blue curve at multiple places. These intersections define a range of candidate solutions, which are the good, the near-optimal solutions, shown by the multiple orange dots. Top 10 lists are also illustrated, um, also illustrate the idea of near-optimal. For example, every night, David Letterman gives the top 10 funniest jokes about a particular person or event for the day, and the segment works because Dave takes the time to tell one, not two, not three, but all the way up to 10 jokes. And what's particularly cool about his lists is that they also illustrate another unsatisfying aspect of optimal, because if you measure funny by the volume of audience laughter, then joke number one on the list is rarely the funniest. So near optimal is easy to show as a top 10 list showing uh, um, as a top 10 list or a graph plotting the times to ski down various ski routes. Near optimal is much harder to show, but it's also a lot more useful 
for complex problems where we have a large number of simultaneous choices to make. With near optimal, we can generate the multiple good solutions for these complex problems that we would never even know exist if we only focused and sought out the optimal solution. And then we can choose a solution from among the good that we can actually sustain. One complex problem that I've been working on um, with two graduate students, Omar Alminagorta and Berahet Tefetzion, is to prevent phosphorus and other nutrients from entering water supplies. This problem potentially affects some 85,000 reservoirs scattered across the United States, and particularly affects a quarter of a million people in Utah who live between North Salt Lake and Ogden, and who rely for their water on a system of wells and reservoirs that include the Echo Reservoir in the Weber River. Now, phosphorus pollution matters because when nutrients get into the water, algae will grow and your water starts to look and smell and taste bad and you get sick or worse. It's incredibly expensive to remove algae once it's in a water body, so solutions actually have to look upstream to prevent phosphorus from entering the tributaries that flow into the water body. For ECHO, three phosphorus sources include cattle getting into and pooping in water, runoff from agricultural fields entering in streams, and grazing land. There are several ways to control phosphorus from, um, from these sources. This can include fencing streams to keep cattle out of the water, allowing grass and other vegetation to grow to serve as a buffer to strip out the nutrients before the runoff reaches the stream, among others. Now, Omar and Berahet, Berahet developed a computer model to identify the optimal phosphorus removal strategy for Echo Reservoir. And in the model, the measure of best was the total cost to remove phosphorus, which we want to minimize. The candidate solutions were what phosphorus removal practices to implement, how much mass of phosphorus to remove with each practice, and in which subwatersheds to, um, to, to do these practices, to cite them. Altogether, there were 39 simultaneous choices to make. Our principal constraint was that the removal practices must lower phosphorus and echo reservoir to the safe level set by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Utah Department of Environmental Quality. This figure shows the optimal low-cost phosphorus removal strategy that the model identified. The left scale and the black line show that the optimal strategy costs just under $1 million. At the bottom, the green, orange, and blue bars show the phosphorus removed by each practice in each of the three sub-watersheds. For example, the green bar, which is above the seventh practice to manage agricultural nutrients, indicates that we remove about 1,000 kilograms of phosphorus in the Weber below Wanship sub-watershed. There are several striking results as you consider the set of 39 bars. First, only five of the bars have values greater than zero, which means that the optimal solution uses a very limited number of phosphorus removal practices. And second, those practices are concentrated in the Chalk Creek subwatershed. So why are these results potentially problematic? Well, first, the Chalk Creek ranchers and farmers aren't going to be particularly happy about having to bear most of the cost of implementing all of the entire program especially a program that's going to benefit the entire watershed and numerous users downstream of the reservoir. Second, farmers and ranchers throughout the watershed will question whether the few selected practices are really the appropriate ones that they should implement. And third, they may just simply refuse to implement them because they don't like them, or they're going to cause, feel some hardship that we didn't actually factor into the model. So now, a very different picture emerges when I sequentially show you some 500 of the 2,500 near-optimal solutions that we've generated and examined to date. Each near-optimal solution cost, shown by the orange circle, is within 10% of the optimal cost. And as the orange circle bounces near the optimal costs, the bar heights vary tremendously, 
as do the locations where we implement the phosphorus removal practices. And in fact, the near optimal solutions can implement any phosphorus removal practice in any subwatershed. Near optimal gives managers tremendous flexibility in how to lower phosphorus levels. For example, managers can scan through the near optimal solutions and select promising ones um, that simultaneously address issues like equity, uncertainty, political, social, or other considerations that we didn't even explicitly include in the model. Remember, the Chalk Creek farmers and ranchers will likely veto the optimal solution because they have to pay for it or pay most of the costs of it. Managers can rather use near optimal solutions to select a better option that they can, that they can sustain over time and that will thrive across diverse conditions. As we think about near best, it can mean 500 or 2,500 or more very good strategies to reduce phosphorus in a reservoir. It can also mean 2,500 fun routes to ski down a mountain or numerous ways a city can meet its water needs. As we solve these and other complex problems, we must move beyond the single best and optimal because optimal is often deeply unsatisfying. Rather, we must identify the near best and choose from those better options. It's the near best that survive and thrive. Thank you.